words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Aren't you glad it says that? It gives understanding to the simple. We don't have to be rocket scientists to figure this out. I love that passage. Because I didn't make real good grades. My folks were kind of happy. You got a B? (laughs) Oh, it's true. It's true. I was number four out of six. And so there was kind of a shaking of the gene pool by the time it got to me. It's like, is that all we had? (laughs) When I read passages like this, I like that. I like that. And this time in your word, in God's word today, is going to give understanding to us regarding one of our core values, which is family, and regarding fatherhood. Fatherhood. And it's good. So let's pray. And I want to take just a moment of silent prayer and give you that opportunity just to ask God. Say, God, in the quietness of your heart, you close your eyes and just say, in the quietness of your heart, say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me as my heavenly father. Talk to me. And he will. He will. All he wants is a listening heart. So let's pray. Just a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll open up in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we we sing, we sing that you're jealous for us. And we sing about your love for us. That frees us, that forgives us, that redeems us, that made a plan to send your son Jesus to die for all of our sins so that we could become your sons and your daughters. It's an amazing grace. And we're amazed. And we love you. We love you for your love, for who you are. We pray that your spirit would speak to each one of us individually through your word, and that we would be listening. You would change us, change our hearts, restore us, strengthen us, according to your word. We pray for our children, our little children, that you would encourage them in their hearts, that they would grow in grace and in truth, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We commit this time to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the children can be dismissed. This time it's under seventh, seventh grade or sixth grade. And if you'll turn with me to Exodus, Exodus 34, I want to introduce this time by reading Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Moses is in the wilderness, and in Exodus 33, 33 verse 18, Moses said to the Lord, I pray, I pray thee, show me your glory. And he said, this is God speaking, I myself will make all my goodness, isn't that wonderful? I'll make all my goodness. What if he said, I'll make all my, my wrath, or my holiness, or my justice? He said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and I'll show compassion on whom I'll show compassion. But he said, you can't see my face. For no man can see me and live. And then in verse five, chapter 34, verse five, it says, 
And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him. And he called upon the name of the Lord. That's Moses. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord. And that's the word Yahweh. The word means I am. The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Verse 7 says, Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will, not, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. What is he saying here? In verse 6, the Lord passed by in front of them, in front of him and said, The Lord, the Lord God. Like I said, the word the Lord is Yahweh, which is just the verb, the Hebrew verb to be. So it literally translated means I am. I am. And then he says, The Lord, the Lord God. I am God. Just the simple word El in the Hebrew. I am um, Yahweh El. And then it says, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. When you hear the term Yahweh, or when you hear the, the term I am, if I walked into the room and said I am, what would you say? You are what? It kind of begs the question, doesn't it? I'm hungry. Okay, no, I, that's what I would normally say. I'm hungry. <laughs> but if I said I am, you are what? And, 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 this, and this passage, I'm a sinner, but God wouldn't say that. In this passage, in this passage, it's almost like I'm going to, well, it is like I'm going to tell you what I am. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Where does that come from? Where does compassion come from? Help me. Out of love. Where does grace come from? Out of love. Somebody who's slow to anger. They're not the big policeman in the sky waiting to get you, hiding around the corner, waiting to catch you. Slow to anger comes from his love and then he says full of loving kindness that's the hebrew word chesed and it means grace and mercy and loyalty faithfulness loving kindness there have been books written on this one word he said that's who i am loving kindness and truth full of it full of loving kindness and truth God is love. 1 John chapter 4. God is love. This is a manifestation of his goodness, of his love for us. The Father is love. There's a parallel passage to Exodus 34. I'm going to read it to you. It's in um, Psalm 103. Many of you are familiar with this passage. If you want to read it with me. Psalm 103. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Psalm 103. It's a wonderful passage. It's a wonderful passage just to read if you're just wondering. Or maybe you're having doubts about the Father's love. Why would you have doubts about the Father's love? I'll tell you why a lot of people would have doubts. It's maybe because of a bad experience with a father. And this is where the healing is. This is where the blessing is, right here. Psalm 103, from David. Bless, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. So, we're forgetful. But if you keep reading this and read it, Read Psalm 103 
a lot. He's going to help you remember some of the benefits. Is it wrong to get benefits from God? No, no. James 1.17, he's the source of every good and perfect gift. He is the source. So there are hundreds, there are thousands, there's an infinity amount of benefits. Forget none of his benefits. And look at the action words. People say, well, I love you. And what would you say? Well, show me. I want to see it, honey. Okay. He pardons all our iniquities, who heals all your diseases. These are love words, aren't they? Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Do you remember the passage in Exodus 34 that says who visits the iniquity on the father's on the children and up to the third generation? Would it be, would God be, would God be a good God if he removed all consequences of sin on the earth? Would you be a good parent? Would you be a good parent if you removed all consequences of your child's rebellion? Would that be a good parent? Would that be love? Would it even be loving for God to do that to, to, to men and nations? It wouldn't. It wouldn't. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is, and this is, a repetition of Exodus 34, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Sometimes you do not experience the consequences of your sin. The reason I said that is about about our sin and God visiting the iniquity on his children, on children's children to the third generation is that he wants us, and we're going to close with this in the end in Luke chapter 15, but God wants our attention. He wants our fellowship. A lot of Christians don't understand this. He wants our fellowship more than he wants our personal or tangible or circumstantial well-being. Did you get that? Wouldn't you want your child's fellowship and even their their obedience so that they're blessed in the different enterprises they engage themselves in, whether it's school or work or marriage or family or anything, wouldn't you want your child following the Lord and walking in obedience to the Lord and walking closely to the Lord, wouldn't you want that more than the big job promotion or the health and the wealth and the prosperity? Please say yes. Because that's more important. And that's what the Lord wants. And that's why we're going to see in Hebrews when we get there next week. No, we won't see this next week. But in Hebrews 12, we're going to see a God disciplines those that he loves. Treats them as children. I love you. That's why things aren't going well for you right now. You're not experiencing my love. You're walking on your own. I want you back. I want you back. Anyway, it says the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. Could you write a book about that word? That's the word, chesed. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great his loving kindness is toward those who fear him. In other words, you're the the one who fears him, the one who's walking in submission to him and growing in their relationship with him is experiencing that loving kindness. We're going to see for for a season, the prodigal son did not experience that. For a season, he did not experience that. We're actually going to see how important it was for the father that he actually get that experience of not experiencing 
his loving kindness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that wonderful? Are y'all awake? Oh, that's so wonderful. And we call that the sea of forgetfulness. Just like a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And really what he's talking about is a father understands the, the weaknesses, the frailties of his children. The weaknesses and frailties of an infant or a two-year-old are very, very different than the weaknesses and frailties of a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old. And the father understands that, if you will. He gets it about you. He gets it. He understands it. He knows when, you're get, when you've got low blood sugar. He knows when, you, when you're just being a pain. And he's patient. He's patient. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He's mindful that we are dust. Aren't you glad that he knows that you're weak? When, when, when you're not being disciplined, you're, you know you're not doing right. And it might be just because you, you want to take a break from being obedient. Ooh, that's dangerous, isn't it? I remember my fraternity brother saying, I'm not going to say his name. Good friend and my roommate. And he said, I'm just taking a break now. He was a believer. He was walking with the Lord. But for a season, he wasn't. I knew it because I was his roommate. I'm just taking a break now. He was all mad at me for asking, trying to hold him accountable. And he took a break and he got what? Can you say broken? <laughs> anyway, it was funny. It was funny. He wanted to be a priest after that. He started walking with the Lord. He wanted to be a priest until he met April. <laughs> Oh, and they're happily married and walking with the Lord. Amen? Amen. <laughs> that was a long time ago. That was about 40 years ago almost. Yeah, but it was. <laughs> love that guy. The Father is love. He is love. And so what I want to do is I want to just look at who the Father is and mix that with love. Because we all know that God is all powerful, right? And omniscient and omnipresent and unchanging and all that kind of stuff. But when you put love into that equation, because you can't separate God like that. The father is all powerful. And he is love. What does that make him? That makes him my refuge, doesn't it? Whose refuge? My refuge. Because if he's love, he's personal. And if he's all powerful, he's strong. He makes him a refuge for the weak. For the persecuted, for the hurt. David, for the hunted. What's in a refuge? Security. Help, quietness, peace in the midst of horrible things, war, pain, and suffering. Romans 8, I'm going to read this real quick. Romans 8. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who? Will tribulation and distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? For just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. God, I live in Satan's world and I've been left here in enemy territory and it's, things aren't right here. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's what the enemy thinks of you. That's what the enemy thinks of you. 
But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who what? Loved us. It's all about his love. For I'm convinced, Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing. That includes you. You're a created thing. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why? Because he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. And he is love. And therefore, there's nothing that can separate you from that love. Can you walk away from it? Yeah, you can walk away from it. You can walk away from God. You can not experience the love. But does that change his love for you? Absolutely not. The father is knowing he's omniscient. And you mix that with love and you can say he is knowing of me. He knows me. Right. I would encourage you to read and study Psalm 139 as if I was the only person on the earth. Imagine that. As if I was the only person on the earth, he is intimate with all of my ways. He scrutinizes my path, my lying down, my standing up. I can't go anywhere without him, his knowledge of, of that. Even before there's a word on my tongue, he knows it. What do we call that? We've called this something before. What is it? He's omni. Any of y'all ever remember anything that I ever say? He's omni-interested. He's omni-interested. Why? Because of his love. Because of his love. He's so engaged in you and what's going on in your life. And that's not selfish. Any more than you as a parent are engaged and, and interested in what your child is doing and, and what they're thinking and how they're feeling. It's just hardwired in us. And it's hardwired in God who is eternal. And, and God being love, the Father being love means, and it says it in, in Exodus 34, he's full of loving kindness. He is kind. He's kind. Do you remember Jesus in Matthew 11? He says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden. He goes, I will give you rest. You're burdened. I will give you rest. It says, he says, then, and learn, take my yoke upon you. Get yoked up with me. We've talked about that. But I, you will learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. He is kind. He is kind. He's not mad at me. Some of you have been raised by fathers that are always mad or always disappointed. And she said, well, God is a father, so God's always mad. God's always disappointed. No. Remember, get the ship out of the, the sea and, and moor it into the harbor of the word of God. No. He's not. He's full of loving kindness. And he's what? Slow to anger. Isn't that a good feeling? He's slow to be angry at me. That's grace. He's merciful. He's gentle. Jesus says it specifically. He says, I am gentle. I'm humble in heart. And you can talk to somebody like that. You can get close to somebody like that. And it's, it's just so crazy gracious that we're in Christ and we're made his son or his daughter. And when we approach God, we approach him because of the blood of Jesus Christ and we are accepted, we're beloved, even if we've walked away from him. The Father is righteous, right? Right? We would say God is righteous. He's impeccable. He's perfect. He's righteous. 
And you can have a righteous person who's not loving, can't you? Mm -hmm. We call that self-righteousness, right? Always ends in legalism on themselves and imposing it on other people. But God is righteous, and when you add or connect love to that righteousness, what do you have? God is good. There's a difference between just being righteous. If you're righteous and you've got love, that makes you good. We talk about God's goodness. We sing about how good God is. God is good. He's not tricky. He's not mysterious or vindictive or petty. But he's good. That moves him to work all things out, what? For the good, for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you notice the condition there? To those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Would it be good or loving for God to work out all things for the good for those that were continually in rebellion to him? Oh, well, I'm going to clean up all the messes. In other words, I'm going to take away all the consequences. I'm going to clean up all the messes because I'm God. I'm the big Santa Claus in the sky. That's not good. That's not grace. It's gross. God made the universe and moral consequences in the universe, and we live in a fallen world. And what's his highest priority if he is love? Our fellowship, us being close to him. And sometimes the difficulty, or many times the difficulty in our lives draws us closer to the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. And for those that draw near to the Lord, that love God, that are called according to his purpose, even the messes he works out together for the good. Why? Because he is good. He is good. He's motivated to work out good in my life. What if someone else makes messes in my life? He's motivated to work them out together for the good in my life. The Father is, ju the Father is just. What's the difference between righteousness and justice? We've said this before. Righteousness would be the speed limit going down the road. Okay? And you're doing 65 or 70 in a 45. Never done that before. Can't imagine myself ever doing anything like that. But you're fine until the guy pulls out behind you, the policeman, and he pulls you over. That's justice. You can't have righteousness without justice. It's not righteousness, okay? You have to have justice. He pulls me over and gives me a ticket. When I pay that ticket, or when I stand before the judge and he gives me a penalty, and I pay that penalty, then righteousness has been satisfied because of justice. And if God is a just God, and you add love to it, love, then what that does is it causes God to send his son Jesus, and then his omniscience puts all my sins. How many of your sins were future 2,000 years ago? All of them. And puts all your sins, all my sins on Jesus, and then God in his righteous indignation executes his justice while Jesus was on the cross so that when Jesus says to Telestai it is finished paid in full God's righteousness his righteous standard was propitiated or satisfied on your behalf and then what do you do you go I'm glad my just God is love or the cross would be, there would never be a cross. There would only be a perfect, impeccable, righteous standard, and we would all fall short, and of course, we would all be subjects of his justice in an eternal lake of fire. God is just, and he is love, and he is propitiated. How about the Father is spirit? Jesus said to the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman, God is spirit. 
they were talking, the subject was the Father. God is spirit. Those who worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. Okay, I get that. I understand that. But when you add love to it, when you add love to it, what does that mean? That means he's always with you. God is spirit, therefore, by means of his spirit. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus is in a body, in a physical resurrected body at the right hand of the Father. That physical body is not omnipresent. Jesus is omnipresent by means of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit lives inside me because of love. That's what makes him intimately acquainted with all of my ways and all of your ways. What does it mean? The Father is spirit and he is love means he's always with me. He's infinitely intimate with me, with you. His spirit is in me. I will never, ever be alone. I may walk away from the Lord and not experience fellowship with him. I'm still not alone. I can always, at any time, experience fellowship with him. I'm never alone. The Christian should never be lonely. People will leave you, won't they? They will forsake you. What does Jesus say? Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, ever. Why? Well, because... The moment you believed in me, Jesus, you were sealed unto the day of redemption. Till the day I see your face, face to face, I will be in you. Isn't that an amazing thing? Well, what if I sin? Then the Bible says you're grieving the Spirit of God. Or you're quenching the Spirit of God. Isn't that cool? It's not cool to grieve the Spirit of God or quench the Spirit of God. What's cool is he doesn't leave. He doesn't leave. I'm not going to leave you. I'll never leave you. You can be unfaithful to me. I will never be unfaithful to you. Doesn't that make you feel good? Doesn't that make you feel secure? Well, that means I can do whatever I want. Go ahead. I'm serious. Go ahead. Do it. Do whatever you want. He gave you a free will. Do whatever you want. He's your father. He's never going to leave you. Doesn't say he's never going to discipline you. Are you never going to be subject to the law of natural consequences? God is spirit and he is love. God is um, the Lord of hosts. Now, this could go on forever. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on for another five minutes and then I'm going to get to Luke 15. The Lord of hosts is God's battle name. He, he says, I'm the Lord of hosts when he's about to kick somebody's tail. Okay, add love to that. Add love to that. And we have songs like, he is jealous for me. He's jealous for me. God has a holy and righteous indignation toward that which enslaves, injures, or extorts his children. In Romans chapter 12, I think it's verse 19, he says, guess what? If you've been injured, enslaved, or extorted by the enemy, whether that be a fallen angel, angel or whether that be a person working through a person, whatever, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You don't even have to take your own vengeance. God says, no, it's easier, it's better if you don't. Because if you leave your hands off it, I'll get my hands on it. I'm jealous for you. You are the apple of my eye. Your father, who spoke the universe into existence. I can defy gravity, you can't. That was supposed to be funny. There's your joke for the day. The father is king. He is king. And he is love. He is king. And he is love. 
What does that make him? Well, I guess that makes him my king. My father is king. My father is the most high God. My king is the father. My king is my father. Oh, well, the king hasn't come yet. The king of kings has not come yet. And everything that we know about the king of kings, he's going to set everything straight here on this earth. But until he does, until he does, I'm living my life, or I choose to live my life, under his authority. I choose to serve my king, not the God of this age. So that should draw some fire, shouldn't it? And there should be suffering. There will be suffering. But my king is a warrior. He's jealous for me. He's not ruling now on the earth, but he will. He will. And that means I live in enemy territory. The enemy hates me. It would be perfectly, perfectly normal in a battlefield where I'm behind enemy lines. And now I've been exposed. Why? Why was I exposed behind enemy lines? Because I named the name of Jesus Christ. And I love him. And Jesus said, if you do that, you'll be persecuted. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. And we suffer, don't we? Say yes. We suffer. But we suffer patiently. That's called long suffering. Waiting in faith for the son. For the son of my father. Oh, wait. Is Jesus God? Are you sure? Jesus is God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Oh, so we're waiting patiently for the Son. The King is coming. Vengeance is mine. I'm his bondservant. The enemy, Satan, knows the king is coming. James chapter 2 says, even the demons believe that. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as their savior, please. Even the demons believe and what? They tremble in their shoes, if they have shoes. That's why you don't have to defend yourself. I'm his bondservant. He is good. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's shaping me. He's forming me. He has a future for me. Listen, now, in this age, for the rest of my days here, and in the, in the age to come, and in eternity, Several more. The Father is our healer. He's our healer. You need to be healed when you've been wounded, right? In this life, the bigger the wound, the longer the healing, right? Yes. If I got a little scratch, it will heal. That's how God designed it. If my arm is ripped off, under the right circumstances, it will heal. But it takes a lot longer. He's the healer. Of the wounded. We live in a fallen world that wounds people. We've all been wounded. We've all been wounded. But our Father is a restorer, a reconciler, a healer, the healer. He's a listener. We're gonna do we're gonna talk a lot about this in our um, connect groups, our first connect group. He hears Hagar. Hagar, he hears Ishmael crying. He's compassionate. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's the seeker. It's another passage, Ezekiel 39, 26. He tells Israel, he goes, I will forget. I'll forget. I'll, I'll make you forget your disgrace and your treachery. That's like casting our sins from the, as far as the east is from the west. I'll make you forget your treachery. What's he saying? If, if you've betrayed the Lord, if you've not been faithful to the Lord, 
I'll make you forget that. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You might have met somebody or had a relationship with somebody that always held your unfaithfulness over you. you but you did this. Love does not keep a record of wrongdoings. Can you imagine a God who would always bring something up, something you did or said or thought that was treasonous to him? He says, I'm not like that. I love you as your father, and I'll make you forget that. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He's a wonderful counselor. He's a seeker. He never leaves us. He's patient. Turn to Luke 15. This is a parable of the the lost son. That's what the title says. Follows two other parables. The lost coin and the lost sheep. Before we even start, does the son ever not become the son in this story? The son is always the son in the story. And really, this is a story about God's faithfulness, the father's faithfulness to the son. And really, it's a story of love. He could be faithful. He could be faithful and just and righteous. And when the son came back, he could restore him and make him pay everything he took but this is a story of God's grace really of his heart of love verse 11 he said a certain man had two sons the younger of them said to his father father give me the share of the estate that falls to me and he divided his wealth between them a lot of times the father would do this most of the time they would give their inheritance before they died which makes perfect sense because they could now be a consultant they could help them with the inheritance Help them manage it. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Was it common knowledge? It was. Because the other son, when he comes back, says, you knew, you, he did this, and you did that? Makes no sense whatsoever, Dad. And the community came Sir, that was the stupidest thing I think I've ever seen you do. You're a good businessman. Let's say the guy's a millionaire. Let's say he's got $2 million. And he just gave a million dollars away. And everybody in the community knew this kid's a loser. He's just going to go blow the whole thing. Why would he do such a thing? Well, what if the son stayed there? No, son, can't do that. I'm sorry, son. I'm just going to have to deal with this. I'm going to teach you how to be disciplined, how to work like your brother. He let him go. He blew a million dollars. I think the father was looking forward to the celebration afterwards. I think the father knew that there was nothing that would get through to this son except what he was about to experience. Just like a good father, a good father will at one time, of course there's discipline, there's training, but at one time or another, he has to say, well, I'm just got to let him go. I've got to let her make those decisions. This father, this father invested a million dollars in his relationship with that son. He didn't care about the money. The money wasn't the issue. It was just fellowship. That's all that was the issue here. Now, in verse 14, when he spent everything, well, that's not rocket science. We knew he was going to do that, right? And they're all sitting there back in the village and say, man, I'm sorry. I, again, so, man, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen you do. Okay. We had spent everything. A severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be in need. This is what the Lord does. Oh, I can do, that means I can do whatever I want. God's love, Romans 8, I can do whatever I want. 
I'm going to heaven. Yeah, you are going to heaven. You're sealed under the day of redemption. Remember the wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3? Everything's burned up, but he shall be saved. Yeah, you're saved. But you've got a loving father, and he knows when to turn off the spigot in your life. When you walk away from him, he knows, if you will, he'll keep you on a short chain. So, nothing, he has nothing. He began to be in need, and he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him in to feed the swine. He's trying to fix it himself, right? He doesn't wake up at this point. He's trying to fix it himself. Well, I'll go, Jeez, I have to work. I never thought I'd have to work again. I have to work. So the Lord does. Verse 16, and he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. This good little Jewish boy is feeding pigs. And in his mind, he's thinking, oh my gosh, this is so, this is horrible. It's disgusting. Still not getting through to him. And they're not even letting him eat. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread and I'm dying here with hunger. He did come to his senses, didn't he? What was more important to the father? His immediate well-being or him coming to his senses through horrible difficulty and, and the father giving a million dollars away, just blowing it in the wind. You need to understand that if you've walked away from the Lord, and many, many have, we've all have at one time or another, it depends on how far you go, okay, that your father has invested his son in you. First of all, you can't lose your salvation, period. Why? Because it's a biblical doctrine. The Bible teaches that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life, period. God has a lot invested. He's engaged. He's there. Comes to his senses. I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Good plan. That was a good plan. He knew his father would hire him back at least. I got to get this stuff off of me first. I won't tell him I was feeding pigs. He got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, wouldn't that make a nice title to a song? While he was still a long way off, what does it tell you? Everybody knows this. His father's waiting for him, looking for him, longing for him. His father didn't go out there and say, no, no, you got to quit doing this. It's better in my house. No. He lets him. It's called free will. He lets him and he comes back. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he got up. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. The word there is he felt it in his belly. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his slaves, quickly, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life. He's not telling people how to get born again here, okay? He's telling us how to regain fellowship, just like John, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. And he's been found, and they began to make merry. The father gives, and he might even give you and I something that we shouldn't have but we keep begging him for so that we'll learn and come back to him okay but he gives and he is patient he'll let us take it as long as we want to take it and the father is waiting and the father's always home he's always home
I thank God that we can go to his word and we can understand who our Heavenly Father is. And every single one of us, it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done. It doesn't matter. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're his child. And for the rest of your life, you're, his design for you, his calling for you is to grow in your relationship with him. And if you want to walk in the world, he will allow that. He will allow that. But you can't erase consequences. And he'll work those things out to bring you back. And that's what's the most important thing to him, is our fellowship. If he is love. If he is love. Amen? Let's pray. You might be here and you've never personally placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You would need to understand that God is love. He loves you. That's why Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins. So that right now, right where you sit, you can have the free gift of eternal life. He paid your debt. And all you have to do is receive it. You can tell him in the quietness of your heart. God, I believe that. I believe. That Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And that he was raised from the dead. I believe that and tell him thank you. Thank you for giving me the free gift of eternal life. Thank you for forgiving all of my sins. Thank you for making me your child forever. Thank you. I want to grow in my relationship with you. You are an awesome father. You might be here this morning and you've walked with God. You've been a child of God and you've walked away from the Lord. And you're suffering as a result, maybe just internally, but you're suffering. He's saying, I want you back. He's saying, come, come to your senses. Understand that your real place of blessing is with me. Every good and perfect gift comes from me. It doesn't come from the things that you're chasing. It doesn't come from the, your fleshly desires. You'll never be satisfied. Come to me. You'll never be rested. Come to me. Father, I thank you that you are a healer. You restore what the locust has eaten. You do orchestrate circumstances in our lives to draw us closer to you. And we are in a war. And it is hard. So much of the time. I pray for my brothers and my sisters that. They that we would draw near to you. That we would know that you are God. We, we would experience your love as your child. With a childlike faith. Experiencing the nurturing, the healing the blessing, the forgiveness, the restoration, the counsel, the consoling that only you can do in us because of your spirit. We thank you for your word that you're full of loving kindness and truth. And that truth restores our soul. It sets us free gives us the abundant life. We love you for who you are. We love you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.